Welcome everybody to another episode of the Nonprofit Show. We're really excited about having our guest on today, Centauri Miner. He's like one of those like luminaries in the sector, in my community, somebody that uh, we've watched and listened to, garnered a tremendous amount of wisdom over the years. And so we have him today on the Nonprofit Show and he is going to really help us to understand how we can be dealing with um, employee wellness and mental health in the nonprofit sector to a far better degree than we have. Centauri, welcome. Thanks for having me. I'm super excited for this conversation. Well, you know, I feel like you've seen it and done it all, and you are the perfect voice of reason to come in and kind of help us uh, realize why this is something we need to be talking about. Um, and so I, I can't wait to, to learn from you and, and have our viewers learn from you as well. Again, if we haven't met, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. Jarrett Ransom, the nonprofit nerd, will be joining us tomorrow. We have amazing sponsors that help us day in and day out. Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, nonprofit thought leader, fundraising academy at National University, staffing boutique, nonprofit nerd, and nonprofit tech talk. These are the folks that join us day in and day out so that we can bring great conversations forward. You can catch us three ways. If you want to join us live, yay team, we're with you. But if you want to go back to one of our 900 episodes, you can find us in our archives. We're streaming, we have podcasts, and we also have, as I like to call it, the sexy new app that the team at American Nonprofit Academy created. Um, just take a quick scan of that QR code, and then we'll notify you with a real subtle ding every day when the new show is uploaded. You can also search our archives as well. At two in the morning and you have an issue, come to the nonprofit show. And, and guaranteed we'll have somebody that's been talking about it. Okay, Centauri Miner, I am so thrilled you're here, my friend. I'm so excited for this, this is gonna be great. Talk to us about what your work is um, involved in Evolved MD. So yeah, so um, Evolved MD was started about uh, five, well, six years ago. So uh, as an um, as a response to the burgeoning mental health crisis. So what we do at the core is we integrate uh, behavioral health into primary care. So what that looks like in practice is that we put a licensed therapist right where you see your PCP. So where you go get a checkup, you can see a therapist. So we started, uh, and then those two people, the therapist and your doctor, uh, collaborate on your care. Uh, we started here in Arizona uh, and have since branched out to Utah, New Mexico, and Colorado. So really trying to saturate the Southwest to great outcomes. And so for us, the big things that we want to do is one, reduce stigma, let everyone know that uh, therapy, counseling, mental health is a priority and there's nothing to be ashamed of to see someone and also increase that access. So by putting it at the place for putting therapy right where you see your doc, um, you have a higher propensity to just go to have the access to those uh, to those services. And um, we're we're seeing a lot of really good things coming out of the model and uh, we're just excited for all the impact that we're having in our communities. You know, it's such an interesting thing. Um, I'm, I'm kind of thinking about two things and that is the number of nonprofits that have been like, wow, we have unhealthy clients. We need to get on site medical care um, so that then we can deal with whatever the other problem is. Are you seeing almost an environment where you have to educate, um, you, you know, your partners as to why this is an important issue and, and, and joining this, this, um, the therapy issue and, and putting that together? No, um, I think one of the, the um, I wouldn't say positive, but one of the beneficial things that came out of COVID was it really exacerbated uh, the nation's understanding and uh, need for mental health services. So around that time, everything was kind of bubbling up and came to the forefront and became very clear that there was a not only just a uh, pandemic as it related to COVID, but also a pandemic and epidemic for mental health. So now it's a little bit more normalized. I would say um, when I joined the organization three years ago, uh, talking to potential customers, there was a little bit more sell on the why. But now um, we have an in uh, influx of folks that are like, we, we need this. And so uh, there's less educating on it now. It's more so just how quickly can we get your services into where we are? Amazing. Well, you know, that's the good news part of this, um, because you're right, we need to normalize this. And even just when I think about, you know, the conversations that we had in the beginning of the nonprofit show, we didn't really talk about this. We talked about burnout um, and getting people a little bit of rest. And that was kind of as 
as deep yeah. as anyone was going. Yep. Right? yep and yep, so yep. we got to go. Oh, and I'm seeing this, Centauri. I'm seeing people go deeper with this, this concept. And one of the things that you point out to us is that managers matter. Talk to us about that. What are you seeing? Yeah, so um, there's a lot of, and I uh, do a lot of work in this area, which is like equipping the leader. And recently there was a um, uh, a thing that came out in Forbes, and I uh, I recently talked to the Association for Fundraising Professionals last a couple of weeks ago as their keynote, and really talked them through this idea that your managers have so much impact on your mental health. So if you're a manager, if you're a people leader, understand that how you show up and what you're doing uh, really impacts and affects the, um, your your employees. And so uh, there was an article in Forbes that talked about the new, j- new data suggests that for almost 70% of people, their manager has more impact on their mental health than their therapist or their doctor. And it's equal to the impact of their partner. So um, if you are a leader, wow. it's there's a lot of gravity in management. There's a lot of gravity in how you do those things. And so I think for if we're even going to have a conversation about mental health, people have to understand that a lot of their mental health has to do with the people that are around them. And if you're a manager, if you're a people leader on uh, listening to this or watching this, really think about how you have to be intentional to make sure that your people are supported. You know, that's stunning because we talk Isn't about that crazy. Yes, it, it is because, you know, we talk about, oh, we have like the work wife or the work husband and the 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 work siblings and you know we we can say sometimes well this is my family i spend more time with them you know in my 24 7 than i do my legit husband wife partner kids right? right but um you know that's something that we really need to amplify because i think so often in management we don't really hear ourselves we just lay down an edict or we think you know people can read our minds and we don't think about that is stunning and it's somewhat frightening i gotta say um it seems to me that this is something that's changed or changing because of uh remote work or what do you what do you think about that is it is it worse is it better i mean that's a good question i don't have um the data to support either way but i will say from observation that do you think that uh, remote work has to um if you're a manager of a remote team, there's just even more things and more steps that you have to set to be intentional. And there are there is some new data that shows that remote workers they're they're having a struggle finding the the balance between work and home, uh, and so they're kind of working out uh, working more hours sometimes. Or um, there's just this propensity to burn out more because you're just always at your computer, always at home. So it takes a manager setting helping set those clear boundaries for their employee of hey, you're done at six turn off your computer, don't be on the computer at 10 at night. But again, for if you're a manager uh, that's either new or not thinking about it, it's just like you have to be very thoughtful about how you're supporting your um, supporting your employees and also the expectations you're setting in a good way. So if your expectation is say, hey, Julia, actually, when you're done at six, I do not want to see any emails from you. I do not yes. want to make, I want to make sure there are no, um, yeah. there are no things going on or meetings after that. And so that the employee feels like, oh, I can actually rest after. And that's a little easier to do when you are physically in an office space, right? Because you you leave the office or you can actually see the person. But I, I do like the call out on remote work because it does make it uh, a little bit more difficult to be a more impactful manager uh, on the mental health front. Right. And I think that it's like the blessing of uh, being able to schedule your emails so that yes. if you are working at 10 at night or two in the morning, you can be like, okay, yeah, this is not going to be delivered until 8.30 the next morning or whatever, right. so that you can temper kind of that that communication. And I, I agree, you know, set some examples. Talk about this because I can't wait. I feel like this topic is something that we could spend an entire week on. Um, I think the human giver syndrome, we kind of, no, we have it, but we're afraid to talk about it. You know, what does this mean and how does it impact? Or I should say show up. Yeah. And so there's a book um, called uh, Burnout, The Secret to Solving the Stress Cycle. And it talks about the uh, human giver syndrome, especially in the nonprofit sector. Uh, and it differentiates between human beings and human givers. Um, and the this idea that if you're in the nonprofit sector, you're just uh, probably typically or social impact sector. I would like. I, I one of the things I want to call out is that Evolved MD is we're um, we're a, a corporate for profit company, but all, all of most of our executive team we came from the social impact nonprofit sector. So it's been very 
fun to see how the nonprofits have informed this corporate work. Uh, but going back to that, the um, the idea that if you're a uh, nonprofit person, you're probably very, very passionate about the work that you do. Mm-hmm. So much so that you feel like you have to give above and beyond to even have a baseline of success. And that's what the human giver syndrome is. It's like there are folks that are naturally wired to just give, give, give. Um, folks that say that, you know, I feel like I'll be called selfish for taking care of myself um, mm-hmm. yeah. or I feel apolog- I feel obligated to apologize for just existing right, uh, for taking time for itself. Those are the things that happen in the nonprofit sector and we have to get ahead of it. I think uh, when I was talking to the Association for Fundraising Professionals, I talked about especially in the nonprofit and social impact sector, people wear burnout as a badge. It's like, I've worked this many hours, I had this event, I've been with these many clients, and that's just not good for you. It's not good for the sector. It's not good for the overall sustainability of the organization. And uh, being a giver is great, but you have to understand that you also have to be selfish sometimes too. So this human giver syndrome talks a lot about that. You know, I think you're absolutely right. We we do wear these things as a badge. And then all of a sudden we're we're perplexed when our staff is all of a sudden burnt out, getting yeah, sick yeah. or they can't right. show up or they're cranky or they have substance abuse issues and they can't take care of themselves or their families. It's like, hey, this is where it's rooted. I used to think that we used the word, um, you know, empathetic or being an empath a, a lot more. Um, but I think this is a better way to look at the actual psychostructure of where we where we give and how we behave. And, and especially in the, the nonprofit sector, um, uh, there was a, 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 a data set that came out of the Sanford Social Innovation Review, SSIR. I'm sure so many people are familiar with it, which yeah. is saying that like half of nonprofit employees are experiencing high levels of burnout. And especially for this sector, thinking about like, I think about it as like unrealistic expectations for the work. Like there's just so much need there with few resources, um, but it's still the expect- expectation is to fulfill that need. So unrealistic expectations just as a sector, uh, work overload and real resources. And then with the human giver syndrome, c- compassion fatigue, like you can only give so much until you just can't give, you're burnt out. Um, and so those are the things that are really kind of bubbling up right now, even more so after COVID. Absolutely. You know, I was speaking to a CEO of a very large nonprofit uh, recently who admitted to me that he thought he might have to retire in another community from his community where he, you know, where he has worked his career because he couldn't stand to see the, the homelessness and that that's wow. where he had worked pretty much most of his career and it was getting worse and they were falling further behind. And it was such a devastation because he's like, every day I leave my office and I go home, I see where we're failing. And yeah, that, it was heartbreaking. That's so hard. Project. That's so hard. Yes. It was heartbreaking. And I was like, wow. I mean, you know, yeah, every day you leave and you're like reminded of a failure if, if in essence. And, and I was just like, it's the perfect example of the, the mental toll that it takes on, on our, on our yeah. leaders. I mean, and, and even more so thinking about not just the the burnout from the work itself. So the the, the, the nine to five job is the burnout from the um, from the empathy that you're having with those clients. It's the burnout from seeing your community either suffer or, or, or suffer or thrive. It's the burnout from having always feeling like that weights on your shoulders. And then lo and behold, probably most of the folks in the nonprofit sector aren't being, because they're just so burnt down, aren't thinking about how do I better take care of myself? Should I be seeing a counselor? I see these things every day in my community. I should probably talk to someone to debrief about this or like get this off of me. Um, and that's just not happening. Um, and understandably so, but it, it, it should happen. Yeah. You know, it's such an interesting conversation um, to, to be with you and talking about this because for so long, and you, you brought this up, you know, wearing the badge, we're tough, you know, our clients have it worse than us. So shame on us if we complain because we have jobs, housing, stable relationships, whatever it is you want to count. Um, so how do we then turn that that organizational approach towards mental health, focusing on our own teams? Like, where does that come from and, and how do we do it? Because this seems to me like a, a long journey. You can't just yeah. say, put up a poster one day in the break room and say, okay, <laughs> woohoo, mental health. It's solved. It's solved. <laughs> um, you're totally right. It has to be much more... Um, 
a deep rooted and systemic within organization. So um, I've for the last two years have done a wonderful, I think, because uh, I've been asked to, to do it a lot, uh, this kind of roadshow on this business case for mental health. So I talk a lot to kind of for profit entities, but most more recently, AFP and some other nonprofit entities around there is a business case for taking care of your people. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of data behind how much absentee and uh, absenteeism causes um, issues to the bottom line or for in the nonprofit case, absenteeism means that clients aren't being seen. And that happens because people aren't taking care of themselves. Um, it's, it happens because like sick days are actually mental health days and people are just like, I need a day to not be here. And there has to be a much more sustainable way of doing that. So really le leaning into the idea that if you're a nonprofit uh, listening to this, the focus has to be on uh, sustaining yourself, your organization by focusing on mental health. And so we talk about um, a lot around just doing the things that um, that that are just being a good human is the best way to put it. So we talked about the manager managers, just checking in with your teams. How are you doing personally, professionally? Uh, what are the things that we can be doing to help you in your um, in your personal life too? I think it's really important to note that gone are the days where you have like, this is who I show up as work. This is who I show up as at home because that COVID made that all blend. And so now <laughs> we understand that uh, people come to work with baggage from the home too, and that's okay. So being open to those conversations, having vulnerable conversations in the workplace are uh, a really good start. Um, understanding that there are just small things that you can do. You mentioned to Julia, which I love, which is uh, we have a mandate that like no emails go out from the company after six. You can hold those emails until eight, the more, do whatever you need to, but there should not be an expectation of anyone on this team that they can't go home and just shut off. There should not be any expectation. So things like that. Um, and then the other pieces are just um, employees are demanding it is what I talk to CEOs a lot about. So if you aren't prioritizing mental health, you will not have a workforce because they will find a nonprofit that it invested the time, the resources, uh, and the energy on saying, I want to take care of my people. I mean, I think a, another thing that I would add, especially for this sector, is executive directors and boards have to understand the importance of mental health and shifting this piece from the, uh, that leads to compassion fatigue and, and burnout of saying, for you to as for this organization to be sustainable and for you to be here for a long time, we have to make sure that you're taking care of yourself, that you're not working 15 hours a day. And by the way, oh, there's an event on Saturday. Can you just go volunteer for that? Because we need you. No. <laughs> the answer is no. And it's okay to set those boundaries. And it's the organization should set those boundaries too. You know, Centauri, one of the things that I'd love your feedback on this for so many of us in the nonprofit sector, we deal with severely... Um, impacted people in, yes. in in mental health issues. And so then I think when then we, we put those labels back on ourselves and we're like, well, I don't have mental health issues because my clients have mental health issues, right? And so how do we bridge this? It's almost like an issue of shame. It's an issue of education, like my, yeah. understanding degrees. Like how do we bring this forward so that we're not labeling our teams as we label think, our clients, if you will. I think that's a good call out. I think um, a good way to do it is just normalizing it. Um, I always start off with some key, like general mental health facts. Um, and this is an outdated figure, it's only gone up, but uh, generally 41% of all US adults have experienced at least one adverse mental health or behavioral health, health symptom. So half of the people that you know um, are going through something. So let's just, let's just name that and say like, let's name that. Um, and we also understand that for, most of those people getting treatment, it's just not, it's not in the cards. And so folks have issues, but they're not getting access to care. Um, and that's something that we want to change. And then I think that the things that are really, um, really kind of harrowing for my, from my standpoint and to your point of like, it's mental health is so silent um, that a lot of times people just don't know. And you can look at someone like an Anthony Bourdain or um, whoever it might be of like, ostensibly great life but things are kind of falling apart and so for the workers in um um for the workers in the nonprofit sector or anyone that you are managing depression looks different for everyone so we can't just say like oh this because i see this person that's a client that's acting this way doesn't mean that my person's not impacted the exact same way um and i also like to call out um suicide is the second leading leading cause of death for americans 20 to 34 and the fourth leading cause of death for americans 35 to 44. so a lot of our teams are in that age range where suicide is the one of the biggest killers, um, death by suicide. And so those are the things where I think it's really important for us to not say, uh, for us not to uh, debate the severity of mental health, but say, if you're going through something, we need to talk about it and we need to provide you the resources, whatever that looks like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
and it, that it's not punitive and that it's, it's not punitive. Yeah. And it's also um, what I, we, what I've been really proud of our company doing and uh, something I pride myself in as a manager is this idea of psychological safety. So my team knows mm -hmm. that they can come to me and we can have a one-on-one -on -one that has nothing to do with work. It's like, this is happening in my relationship. This is happening at home. And me as a manager has to sit there. I'm excited to sit there and say, all right, let's talk more. Are there things that we can do? Have you talked to our EAP program? Is there recommendations that we can do? Or is there just something I can do as a, as a manager and as someone one that you trust in your life to help support that. And just even having the option of being able to go into your boss's office and say like, this is a terrible day. This is what's going on at home. I just need to be able to have this space. That goes a long way. That doesn't cost you anything to just be a good human to your people. But you know, when I hear you say that, um, it seems to me like there's a cost of training and knowledge because how many managers can I know. deal with that? And, and that's nothing, I mean, I, I, I have never had training on that. I've never seen that. I mean, it's uh, in school that was never, that's never spoken about in business school. I mean, it's kind of like, what is your level of empathy and how are you gonna navigate it? And I think there's a lot of ways you send out signals that are like, I'm not receptive to that. Right. Versus, I am receptive to it. You can come to me, right? So how do we train our management level to understand that this is a new way of doing business? That's a great question. And I, um, so I, I'm lucky to be a contributing writer to Forbes Jobs, which is like a, a sub brand of Forbes that focuses on career development. And I uh, released my most recent article yesterday, which was like the five things first time managers should know and awesome. seasoned managers should remember. And one of the things was um, that the, the first part of it is like no one really receives management training. And I've seen this across not just nonprofits, but even some of the larger organizations in the world where you think, like, oh, of course they have something. It's like, nope, you're a really good individual contributor, you seem competent. Now go manage this team. And people are like, what? what? <laughs> okay. Um, and so I think, one, everyone just has to, um, organizations should have intentional um, intentional training for that. But I do think there's something to be said about um, leaders and CEOs and boards modeling that that behavior. Like modeling does a really good, um, uh, a really good way of showing that just being a good, like really asking those questions are, um, are something that you're going to have to do. I think the, the other piece, Julia, that I always say in this presentation is, kind of you're going to have to do it because this uh, next generation of employees, that's what they're demanding and they're going to go find it somewhere else. So uh, yeah. the best thing you can do is equip your managers to be empathetic and they don't have to be touchy. -feely. I'm no one would ever describe me as a touchy feely person, um, but I can hold space for people. And I think anyone can do that with a little <laughs> bit of um, with a little bit of training and coaching around that. It's not as insurmountable as you might think. Oh, my God. That's going to be my new buzz <laughs> phrase. Hold space. I love that because you know, it does kind of, I don't paints a picture for me because I'm that way too. I, you know, so I'm a lot older than you and I really was raised on the, you go to work, yep. especially as a female. And yep. when you walk out that door with your briefcase and your suit on, you're no longer at home and you're yep. no longer at home until you come back you right. know, after five or six or whatever. And so you, you know, it's a fascinating shift on it's so all fascinating. of us. And I, I mean, we could um, maybe in a year we can come back on and have a conversation about just kind of generational um, differences in the workplace as it relates to this. I, I, I'm in that, t I was an elder millennial. And so I was taught, you just grind, you grind, you grind, you do the work, you do the work and you keep raising up. And it's like, why? Like, why did we do that? Like, why did we, why was I taught that? <laughs> That's so unhealthy. Um, and so the, just un even undoing some of the things that we were all taught and learned in whatever generation to, to, to support this work. Yeah, it's it's riveting because I think I speak I spend a lot of time with, uh, you know, CEO level and of course they're older and they totally don't get what's going on with this these next generations to the point where it's not only frustrating, but it's damaging their 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 organizations and frustrating them to the point where they're like, screw it, I can't lead because I don't understand how to get yeah. to, to these to these demographics. And so what right. you're talking about is is really one of those conversations that we need to start having and weaving in. You know, we don't have a lot of time left and I just I feel like you're just so riveting and I I know we've we've identified some of these problems and we've really um, highlighted the process and of why we need to be thinking about this. But what does it mean to take care of yourself? How do we do this, even if we don't have an ecosystem or managerial system that supports us? What are, what are some of the things that we can do? 
That's a great, great question. And so um, I, one of my articles this year was uh, entitled true leadership means emotionally taking care of yourself. And so I, I, I had that same, that exact premise of like, of the things you can control, what can you do? And one was um, setting healthy boundaries and prioritizing yourself. And so going back to the human giver syndrome, mm -hmm. the best thing I learned in my thirties and after gut therapy is like, it's okay to be selfish. So even if it's outside of, um, outside of work, uh, even with your family, it's okay to say no to things that just aren't serving you. And that's so hard because we're raised to be people pleasers, but set healthy boundaries and what that, however that looks to you. Um, and so just really being thoughtful and with your, if, depending on your relationship with your company, uh, your the nonprofit you work with or the um, your boss of like setting really healthy boundaries of, hey, I'm not available for that. I think I'm so blessed to have a, um, uh, a CEO so that I report to that I can say like, I'm I'm just not in the space for to do that. And it's not going to be good for me. So can I can this not be the expectation and setting those boundaries? And sometimes it's a absolutely sometimes it's like we just have to do this. And I totally understand. But like actually making sure that you're prioritizing yourself, being selfish is not it's not bad. Like it's okay to do that. Uh, and we have to get that out of in our minds. Um, making self-care part of the daily routine. So find the one thing that really provides you energy. For me, it's I work out every morning. Um, but it might be reading a book. I have an employee that like she likes to play the piano. So every day we've talked about like, have you played the piano today? So whatever that is for you, uh, it might be watching keeping up with the Kardashians, whatever it is. Make sure you oh, do no. it every day. <laughs> right. Make sure you do it every day so that you get that energy um from something that really, really uh provides you like something that you love and can um, help you take care of yourself. Um, I love the, the, the one that I also talk about is like spend more time with the people who give you energy. I said like, look at your Outlook calendar and think about like the people that you're super excited to like for that appointment and then see the people that you're like, oh God, I got to do this. Spend less time with those people if you can uh, and be thoughtful about who are the people that actually Fill, fill you up, you feel energized afterwards. Right. Be very intentional about spending more time with them. Um, talk to your company about what mental health means to you. So I think a lot of times people just assume that there's like this uh, divide between personal and professional or just like the person themselves and the professional. And I, I talked in my article yesterday, like managers have to be good with the whole person. And that also means you as an individual going to your boss during your company and say like it's really important that i can set these boundaries that mental health is a priority so what can we do to get there uh and then my, my other tip is just like if you can get professional help i've been in therapy since i was 24 25 years old it is the one thing that i will always make time and resources for um it's been a life changer and a game changer and so uh, if you can make sure you go see just go see someone yeah you know having having known you and, and watched your career you are a lovely man and you you have a, an otherworldly presence and i've got to believe that that has added to to this you know piece of you being comfortable and being sage um and so yeah i think it, it's it's really important and especially for those of us that work in the nonprofit sector absolutely it is absolutely. you know grimy i mean even just my work doing this show and and working with clients it's exhausting and i'm not on the front lines but i witness what is going on to the people that i work with and it is really tough it's really tough. so tough it's 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 actually um it's kind of crazy to me that like more and more folks don't that do this very very hard work aren't seeing someone it's like how do you process what you just saw today it's so yeah. hard yeah 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 i know and and i i find that i mean i ask that question a lot of the people that i work with i mean what did you do to heal yourself? Not your clients, not Love your that organization. Question. What did you do? And it's it's so brutal the number of people that are like, I, I I can't answer that. I didn't. You know, and it's like, well then that's where we need to start the conversation. Because if you can't answer that, then you can't help those that you're you're trying to help, right? That's exactly and, right. And you're gonna leave. You're gonna leave us. And you're gonna leave our sector. And we need you here. We need you here healthy and 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 wise and so wow you know what i am so honored that you are a part of our sector um i know you have such an amazing uh presence nationally i am thrilled that you're sharing your knowledge and your passion this is great on. yeah centauri centauri minor vp of strategy chief of staff evolved md check out evolved md they're doing some really cool things and hopefully they'll be coming to your community soon as they really flourish um, throughout you know, this region of our country, the Southwest. Um, it's such an important issue. And I think this is a, a fabulous 
um, opportunity for all of us to see you moving forward. Again, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. Jarrett Ransom, the nonprofit nerd, CEO of the Raven Group, will be back with us tomorrow. Again, I want to give one more shout out to our sponsors who are here with us. Um, allowing us to have these conversations. Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraising Academy at National University, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Nerd, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. So Centauri, every day when we end this show, we sign off with this like certain message. And this message is has maintained, I say it every day, and Jarrett does too. But it has, its intention and how I hear it and how I speak it has changed. From the beginning, we started this message because it was COVID. And then we've, we've morphed through different um, issues in our country and in our sector. And today, I say this with mental health in mind. And it goes like this. To stay well so you can do well. Thank you so much, everybody. We'll see you back here for another episode of The Nonprofit Show.